And how do we obtain a yield? So right now these farmers, again, we hear about food spoilage because the products can't be refrigerated right away. There could also be the potential where you have a surplus of food. So the wholesalers don't need everything that you've got. Or you've got some food, when you're, when you're a commercial grower, your peppers and your tomatoes have to be a certain size and they have to look a certain way. And if they don't, they get rejected. So there is actually quite a bit of rejection of food that people just don't see. And that could be millions of dollars that's wasted every year. How do we capture that? So that food could be turned into preserves or canned food. So if this community wanted to really increase local entrepreneurship, build local wealth, retain more wealth in the community, this surplus, which is being wasted, what if some people got together and built a community kitchen or a commercial kitchen for the farmers to come and process that surplus or those you know, second vegetables, not first, into preserves that could be sold throughout the year. So capturing more money, not only does that save them from just wasting it, but it's actually an increased profit to the farmer. They can sell those products at a higher, higher profit margin. And again, it really starts with the school children. We want our children to have the healthiest, freshest food, and likely that is local food. So how do we find ways to build local wealth, but keep our people here, and especially our kids, as healthy as possible? Producing no waste is a, another permaculture concept. In nature, there is no waste. It's really a biological cycle. Every <laughs> byproduct from anything in nature becomes food for something else, whether it's mushrooms for decomposition or you know, worms that then eat that waste that provide their waste, which becomes food for plants. How do we start to close those loops in our own communities and in our technical systems? So that today we look at pollution, and pollution is really just you know, an unused output. So it's an output that's, that's in the atmosphere or that's going into the ground. How do we use that? How do we reduce the pollution? But is there a way to use it creatively as food for another system so it doesn't become pollution? And again, you know, this local food system, if we're talking about the Grand Traverse area, fewer emissions because we have lowered food miles. If we get more of this $32 million food spend to be from local foods. And healthier kids and adults if we're eating the freshest most available food. Permaculture really tries to look at small and slow solutions. If you really go out and try to do everything at once, it can be really overwhelming and very difficult to have success. But if you pick small phases that you can guarantee success, you build more excitement because you're having small successes along the way as you're building up to the overall vision and goal of what you want for your area. So for this area, how do we phase in these solutions, maybe a commercial kitchen and then work on farm to school, you know, and what's the next thing and the next thing. And you see the statistic up here. I think this is also a national statistic, which I got this from the, the statistics right here in, in Traverse City, but 1% of the area works in agriculture, 35% in retail. We all know where the economy is headed right now. We need to really move people more into these sectors that are going to be growth sectors, and retail likely is not one of them right now. Value diversity, again, diversity means resilience. Biodiversity means resilience and pest resistance. So not just these commercial farmers that already have farms, but what about community gardens, giving the local people somewhere to grow food if they're not able to do it at home? What about diverse local farms? So instead of monocropping wheat or corn, can those farmers use multiple products, you know, beans, corn, squash, kale, that can be sold locally so that if one of those crops fails, they have another one that they can go to. Instead of having a potato blight or you know, some problem with the corn where it wipes it all out and you're done, and now you just collect your government subsidy because you didn't sell anything, how can we just have more resiliency and more diversity on these farms? And in order to do that, we need to support the local farmers to buy from them where they really have no incentive to grow more diverse forms of food. You know, we need more backyard growers. We need more spin farmers. And for those of you that aren't familiar with spin farming, it's starting to get out there on, on the news and in the Wall Street Journal. But it stands for small plot intensive farming. If you look up spin farming on the internet, it's basically a bunch of people that are trying to figure out how do we grow commercially in the urban and suburban areas of our cities or states. So right now, 
this small plot intensive takes a, a model of how do we use really small spaces all over the place, not just in one centralized area, to grow food that we can use to create income for local people, deliver that to the farmer's market and the restaurants, you can grow with this method you know, right in the cities and be a commercial grower in the cities on a small scale. How do we use more perennials in our agricultural systems? So we saw this 140 acre permaculture farm. Even the monoculture farms today, if you look at a lot of them, not necessarily in Michigan, I know we have more trees here at our farms, but in other states, there are almost no trees on these monoculture farms. Could they start growing rows and rows of tree crops or perennial crops now because they take so long to establish and yield that they can start them today at a small scale and eventually they'll have another source of income as they move forward. And again, integrating animals and plants as well. Not just thinking that you know, a farm is just plants or just animals, but how do you integrate both of them using this relationship of permaculture to how do the animals benefit the plants and how can the plants benefit the animals in a system? So overall, in the, in the Grand Traverse area, you can build resilience by trying to become more local, keeping the wealth local here without going out of the area. Commercial kitchen might be a way to do it. Supporting your local farmer, trying to grow more of your own food. Uh, and then, you know, really creating jobs. I heard a quote the other day that it's very hard to outsource local food. So this can really be an area where people can get excited about here in Michigan. You cannot get this away. I just wanted to go through like a quick example of something that I, you know, I tried to buy local foods and benchmark a little bit of, of where I was for the year. So just a personal example, I, I found that for 2008, so I'm not counting yet November and December, 38% uh, of our food purchases were from local food. That came out to $1,450 for the year so far that we spent on local food. There's only two of us, so a family of four would be slightly different numbers. We spent about $120 a month on local versus our total bill, which was $385 a month. So these are just some of the things that we, we purchased was a CSA, which is Community Supported Agriculture Share, which I pay up front and get a share in a farm. So that farm gives me a share of vegetables every week throughout the growing season. If they're doing really well, I get a lot of vegetables. If they're not doing well, I don't get so many, but they get money up front so they can function throughout the year and then I get vegetables throughout that time. And it usually comes out to be cheaper than if I was to go to the grocery store and buy those vegetables. I bought you know, a cow locally and a lamb from a local farmer, some chickens, eggs, and then I get my milk locally every week. So we looked at this five mile radius in Traverse City that I picked, and I think the number was about 11,000 people lived in this five mile radius. So what if just 10% of people in that five mile radius tried to spend 38% locally on just food. You know, what does that look like? It's about one and a half, a little over one and a half million dollars. That's 10% of the people buying only 38% of their food locally. That's just food. So this can really be a big impact to an area. When you look at these areas of Michigan that are declining, where our jobs are starting to go away, how do we keep more money locally and how do we create these resilient local economies? Food is really a great place to start because no matter what happens with, with what Richard and these guys are talking about with energy, if everything collapses tomorrow, you're still going to have to wake up and eat breakfast and get food. So 